wine. We have. We've both had a wine. <laughs> We've had two wines. Everybody, everybody can relax. Um, let's just do some shows of hands just to make sure you're all concentrating, just to give you a flavour of what we've been chatting about downstairs. Put your hand up if you're a football fan. Okay, oh you're in the minority. <laughs> uh, put your hand up if you love Harry Styles. <laughs> Actually, I would say about level for she Harry and football, right? In there. Put your hand up if you're a football fan and you love Harry Styles. Uh, two. Yeah. One, yeah. two. Okay, good. <laughs> um, more challenging now. Uh, put your hand up if you're British. Okay, put your hand up if your place of permanent residence at the moment, where do you think of yourself as living, is not in the UK. Oh my God. Everybody is a UK dweller at the moment. Okay, oh. it's good to, good to know what we're dealing with. So, Mr. Sir. Yes. Um, Mark didn't do the kind of, in a nutshell, your story. You wrote that amazing essay in Nicholas Shukla's The Good Immigrant, which kind of right. is the squished down version, if you like, of, of, of what happened. Just give us the kind of, mum and dad move here from Uganda. Yes. Then what? Okay. Um, I'll give you like the main beats. Mum yeah. and dad moved here from Uganda um, in the mid 70s to flee the Armenian dictatorship. They had me. Dad won the first black consultant surgeons in the UK. Mum, doctor, won the first batch of GPs, I think. Uh, dad went back to fight against the new dictatorship because there was a new one. Got killed in the war in 83. My mum brought up all of us by herself. I went to um, boarding school. Well, prep school, boarding school system, including Eton College. <coughs> Went to uni at Oxford, did a law degree, then left that to be a writer, to be a poet. I know, don't get me. Uh, a poet, and then ended up becoming a, a poet, communications advisor, um, football writer, political journalist, and a, a writer of fiction and non-fiction for adults and children, uh, and a musician, actually, for a few years. And then moved to Burden at the age of 34, I'm now 43. <laughs> Where has it all got? No, that's the, yeah. So yeah. we're going to just take a few of those things yeah, sure. broadly in order a bit, or we can talk about how we like. Jump around. Tell me, yeah. what are your memories of your dad? How old were you when your, when your dad died? Honestly, uh, my first memory of my dad was, was <laughs> it's bleak, but it was his coffin in the living room. Oh, um, so. Yeah, so I was four years old. He was killed in the war, went to Uganda, and the first two memories are his coffin in the living room and actually burying him, because when you're the oldest son, you have to put the first piece of dirt on the grave. So yeah, right. that was my introduction to mortality. Um, and I think, I've said this before, but it's funny, grief. You, the most important relationships in your life can be with people you've never met. Hmm. Uh, because grief occupies a funny place in our emotions. It's like. In our family tree, a lot of us have parents that are still alive, but in my family tree, it was grief, and it was the idea of someone. So you're always chasing that because you'll never really, you'll never match up to the idea of someone. And as I've got older, my dad has become more human in my imagination, which is healthier for mm -hmm. everyone involved, including him. Mm -hmm. um, and my relationship with him has become healthier, which is good for everyone, including him. Super interesting. You're, so how many siblings? Four. You and four more? Yeah. And brothers and sisters? Uh, three sisters, one brother. Okay. Yeah. But you're the oldest boy? Oldest boy, which is a thing because it's still quite a patriarchal society. So it's weird. You know, we're very much indulged. In patriarchal societies, men are indulged, but also we are expected to produce and provide. And <laughs> some could argue as a bisexual black poet, I've neither produced nor provided. <laughs> <laughs> There's still time. I think it's going to come. <laughs> Listen, I, as someone that works in football, I know when the final whistle's gone and it blew about 10 years ago. So, yeah, yeah, time's up, time's up. Um, in the, what, what's, if you haven't read Mrs. Essay in um, The Good Immigrant, I really recommend you, you do it because it's, it's kind of a, it, it tracks along. Like you just did it just then and I did this and I did this. And there's some brilliant turns of phrase that I don't know if they're intentionally funny, but you sort of, and then I found myself at Eton, which, <laughs> you know, it's all, it's all I, it hasn't happened to me, but you know, like, so I, I'm genuinely, I'm genuinely interested. We've just both realized um, that at, at a moment in time, Musa must have been sitting in his 
living room with the telly on at the exact same time that I was sitting in mine up in Yorkshire watching a documentary called Class of 91. Mm. I'm saying class. Listen to me, that's not Yorkshire, is it? Class of 91. <laughs> um, about the sixth formers at Eton College. And it had a profound effect on you, as it did me. I think that documentary, weirdly, is why I ended up being a journalist, because it's all about the, the head boy and he's editing the school magazine and he has a fight with his housemaster and da da da. But you were watching it too. Yeah, and um, I watched that. I was at a school in nearby Langley at the time, and I watched that and I thought, I want to go and study there. Which was a weird choice at the time, because in the old sort of 12 plus system, I had a place at an amazing grammar school. Shout out to Langley Grammar. I was going to go there, and, and I just thought, if I go to Eton, seeing on TV it was so grand, I was like, if I go there, I can kind of go anywhere because that felt like a kind of gateway to any world you wanted. So I said to my mum, look, how would I go about going there? And she said, well, you'd have to do this exam and that exam, I'd have to earn more money and you'd have to pass these exams and maybe get a scholarship. And so I did all of that and she did all of that and I ended up going there. Um, and yeah, it was, you know, obviously a school like that is a real experience. The experience of the bit before, yeah. the pressure you put yourself under, that yeah. your mum was under then. Yeah. Tell us a bit about that, because you're little when this is happening. What, are you 11? So you had uh, Jazz on stage before, right? Yeah. So Jazz, was, I, was, I saw him, I was like, that guy's from South Sudan. Like, I've seen, yeah, that, like, because we're from, we're neighbours, right? South Sudan and North Uganda, or my family, we're, we're neighbours basically. So I'm like, that's a very specific aesthetic how he looks. Now, the life expectancy in the North of Uganda, there's a point to this. The life expectancy in the north of Uganda in the late 90s was the highest, the child mortality was the highest in the world yeah. because you were basically being wiped out by the current dictator. Mm -hmm. So then the pressure that puts on you, you're like, hang on a minute, most of us don't make it to the age of five. Hmm. So only one in two people in my ethnic group will make it to the age of five. That was the context in which I grew up. So knowing that one in two of us is not even making it to the age of five, living the diaspora, I was like, you have to live a life that is worthy of the people who have died. So that's where the pressure came from. It was like... Even at that age, you yeah, were cognizant you, of that you thing. Yeah, completely absorb it. You call, you know, in the same way that like, when, you hear your, when you hear your parents arguing, yeah. right, you absorb it. Mm. Now, there was a point in the 90s where there was an invitation to a funeral almost every single week because one other thing that hit the culture at that time was the AIDS epidemic. Mm. There were rumours, unsubstantiated, that soldiers were being arrested and then being injected with HIV infected blood and discharged into the community again to infect other people unknowingly. This was the rumour, but the deaths were just horrifying. So mm. you're seeing invitations to funerals throughout your entire teens. It's so the pressure on you to achieve something, the pressure not just to go and do a corporate job like everyone else, but try and do something and mm. reach for something more, was there from like, it was there before I could even understand it. And it's funny because you think to yourself, oh, this pressure, where's it coming from? But the older you get, you're like, no, it was constructed. The pressure wasn't imaginary, it was actually there. You had to go out and live a life that was worthy of the people that hadn't had the chances you had. And you arrive at Eton College yeah. in a funny outfit. Yes. And the other boys are yeah. different from you. Very much so. You know, I was, look, I'm still middle class, right? So my, both my parents were doctors. My, my dad had died, but we still had a middle class family. Like my, but, but <laughs> Eton's not middle class. <laughs> it, it wasn't then and it isn't now. Yeah. Like, like. We couldn't afford, even with a scholarship, a 50% scholarship, I couldn't afford that school now, right? Um, Does anyone here go to Eton? At the back. That, that's the one that will admit to it, so there's probably three or four others. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the Trojan horses, man. Yeah. Listen, <laughs> respect for the honour. Thank you for the honesty, man. <laughs> Salute my brother. <laughs> so, um, yeah, like, that school is not a middle-class school. It is a school of the kind of, yeah, it's the global elite, right? Yeah. And... They come from all over the world. Yeah, but it's right? so funny because it's it's so funny because it's the first school I realised that wealth was not a number. Okay. What I mean is like, my mate was like, oh yeah. So years after leaving, because like people who are really wealthy are really discreet with their money, right? Because they have to be kidnappings, or whatever, and also people use them. My mate was like, oh like, most of the funny thing is at school, the first friends I had was all for the money, and I'm like, I was like, dude, we were friends at school. You're from Barnes. You're not. You're a middle class kid. He goes, well, no, we had a house in Barnes but oh. my family's wealthy. I'm like, how? We've known each other for 20 years. How come you're wealthy? He was like, well, um, I said, what do you mean wealthy? He said, okay, well, uh, let me put it this way. My family had a monopoly on all the trade that came into a major European city for years. Wow. And that was the school. That was, that was a guy I'd known for 15 years before he told me what his family actually did. 
you know. So Eton was full of places and people like that. And you talk about in the essay about, um, and in, uh, in my mind, they're sort of weird sort of corollaries of one another. On the one hand, you talk about this strange, conflicted gratitude mm. that you felt. Yes. And on the other hand, you talk about a sort of need to do some kind of ambassadorial role. You were like the sort of Olympic gold medal winning Etonian in many ways. You were really trying to tick all the boxes. Well, there weren't many black people there. Like, yeah. So you had like, out of 1,260 boys, 1,270, like you had, there were like four black dudes there, right? And then like of those black dudes, at least one or two were from, you know, African aristocracy and I wasn't. So even you're people expecting, so you're like, you're such a minority than a minority. You're a middle-class black guy in that school, which is standing out. So you're visible anyway, and then you have to deliver, right? Because this is the thing, a lot of these people have never had a black person talk to them on an intellectual level that's equal, right? These people in these rarefied environments, black people are their servants, their workers. These people are from, you know, the diverse countries, but still, any, and I've traveled a lot with work, right? And I see, it's weird that the older I get, the more painful racism gets. The more successful I get, the more of these spaces I go into, the more rarefied they are, and the fewer black people there are, like myself, but there are more black people working as the staff. Yeah. And most of those boys have grown up in a context where black people are their staff. And all of a sudden, they've got a colleague, a boy in their class, their football team, who's not staff, who may be smarter than them, better at football or whatever, or whatever. And it's, it's, it, it breaks people's brains sometimes. Did you feel at the time of, it might be impossible to answer this question, but did you feel at the time that you were there, you were a kid, you were in this super intense environment, mm. it's all going on and adolescence is awful for everybody anyway, before you add in that. Did, were, you, were you conscious of inner strength, resilience, all that kind of gear changing you were doing? Did you, did you know it was day. happening? Every single day. I worked out the school fees my mum was paying per day. So I worked it there every single day I was there, she was paying 20 pounds for me to be there. So I had to make it worth 20 pounds of her money every single day I was there. I literally went through my entire school calendar was like bullet points, I have to achieve this, I have to edit this magazine, I have to run that society. I think I ran, this is not a boast, it's just because I felt I had to get her money's worth. I ran every society I could. I was on the committee of everything I could be. I was like, I have to, I have to get her her money's worth. I was conscious all the time, like even the self-control, like I didn't drink a drop of alcohol till I was 22 because I could never, I was like, you can yeah. never let these people see you drunk or stoned, ever. You cannot let rich white people who've grown up with images of black men stereotype, you cannot let them ever see you drunk or stoned, ever. Mm. I didn't drink a drop of alcohol till I was 22 for that reason, actually. So I was always aware of it. So you went all the way through your undergraduate degree as well I know. with that same rule. I know. I tell you this, the law degree at university, I was out four nights a week and no one could work out why. They're like, how the hell are you out all the time? I said, because a law degree, no offense to law, is boring as hell. It's so boring. <laughs> oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Hands up who's done a law oh degree. God. Oh my God. Yes, exactly. No one. <laughs> oh my God. It's like having a, um, it's like having a conversation with a block of concrete. <laughs> I couldn't believe it when I saw, I don't do law, when I saw what my friends who were doing law had to do, I couldn't believe it. That was literally the work they had to do. It was a do. thing of profound so spiritual dull. horror. Oh. <laughs> uh, well, I'll say this, no, in fairness, in defense of the law degree, so the first two years were that, because the first two years, you're learning the building blocks. And in the third year, it's spectacular because you know all the material, then it can be creative. But the first two years were so horrifying, I tried to leave the degree. Okay. I hated it that much. Yeah. And my friend turned up, he came for his interview the year after me because he'd been on gap year, right? I know, what a concept, a gap year, a year off, I know. <laughs> gap year. Gap year. And he was like, oh, Musa. And he came for the interview and he was like, oh, Musa, like, how are you doing? I was like, yeah, I'm good, I'm good, yeah. And he was like, Musa, he said, you're hating it. Oh. You hate this degree, you hate your law degree. And I'm like, don't say it, please, Nick, don't say it. I said, Nick, if you tell me that, if you let me acknowledge it, I won't finish it. You have to let me just acknowledge, you can't let me deal with it. Because, and again, I did a law degree because I'm like, I'm a black dude, right? So. If I do an English degree, which was my first love, how employable is a black guy who does an English degree compared to a black guy who does a law degree in our racist job market? Mm. A black guy who does a law degree who's qualified, who goes to Oxford, they can't say shit to you. In the most racist countries on earth, if they see you've done law at Oxford, they're like, that dude's got a brain. Yeah. But if I go and apply for English at Oxford and don't get in because people are so smart, and I go and do English at a different uni, 
all of a sudden it's harder to rent a flat, yeah. it's harder to get credit, and doing the law degree protected me from so many things. The amount of times I was negotiating a deal or going for rent somewhere, when I was struggling as a writer, people were like, you did law at Oxford, you're smart. Mm. And it was my safety black, my, no, it was my security, it was my force field. Yeah. So from an early age I was conscious of, and I, I, English is the love of my life, and my English tutors couldn't understand why I did not do English at A-level, and I said, it's because I'm black. They didn't get it. Mm. Now they get it, because mm. the choices I've made have borne it out. But yeah, at the time people thought I was, I was lo I'd lost it. You proud of your degree? Absolutely proud. I was actually back there recently um, to receive an, an award from my college, actually, which oh. I'm very proud of. And the person that gave me the award at the dinner was my law tutor, nice. who always believed in me. And he yeah, said, nice. finish your law degree and then do whatever you want. Finish your law degree and qualify as a lawyer, then do whatever you want. Because he said, I understand it. We're from the kind of same ethnic kind of backdrop. Mm. He's Jewish, obviously me being black, like, you know, and he was like, I get it. We come from cultures where... Mm. We can't just go and do what we love. Like, I'm Jewish, you're black. We can't just go and do that. We don't have those liberties and those securities, but you will get there. And he was right. Good advice. Years later, yeah. Did you? Solid. Amazing human. Amazing. Mark Friedland, great human. Um, not in the same, not in the essay, but another <coughs> article. Um, and we're going to move on from me and leave it behind. Uh, you talk about, because um, there's been a lot of chat since Boris Johnson's been Prime Minister before that, Cameron, Eaton, it's almost become a sort of bogeyman a yes. bit. Um, you didn't hate it. You've talked a lot about that, although you kind of... I'm a disappointed ex. <laughs> and a disappointed ex is actually worse than someone that hates you because if you have a disappointed ex, they're not going to get back with you. Actually, hate would be more useful for Eaton because then they could use that and be like, he's still attached. I'm not attached to it. I don't have... Um, I don't have an emotional attached. I, I treat it like scar tissue. Mm. I'm proud that I went there. I'm mm. proud that I did what I did there. And it's part of me. I'm part of the establishment. But I also, I, I feel indifferent at this point. I think mm. that that school has a tremendous amount to answer for. And a lot of the people that went there should be ashamed of themselves, actually. They should be ashamed because they can stand up and go, oh, we're not eating, that's not us. Here's the thing, right? A teacher was sacked to eat a few years, uh, a few months ago because... He was basically like teaching people about traditional masculinity. He was sacked. And there was a big open letter signed by hundreds of people about, it, yeah. yeah, reinstate him. Where was the open letter condemning David Cameron as not one of us? Where was the open letter from Old Etonian saying, we renounce Boris Johnson? He does not represent. No letter, because actually people are too self interested. And they're cowards, actually. Hundreds of people leave Eton every single year. They're cowards because they're silent, because the same few people are always out there criticizing it. And I was asked recently um, to write an essay about this, about Eton and Boris Johnson, I said, no. I said, no, here's why I said, because there was a famous, there was a tutor who wrote a letter, John Clawton, who taught me actually, criticizing Eton, saying that he'd failed, he said, I failed, I've, I've not taught the students well enough, that's why Boris Johnson was created. I said, hang on a minute. And they, they wrote to me, oh, Moose, can you write us an essay? I said, no. Because what's going to happen is it'll be the same few people criticising and they'll say that I'm bitter. And the conversation said, how about those cowards who are saying nothing in the public eye come out and say something? Because they all write to me privately, oh, Musa, good on you, can argue this. Said, no, mm -hmm. it's just like being at school again when the bully steps up and you don't say anything. And the reason Boris Johnson got there is because you're all busy benefiting from him. You love Boris Johnson because he makes you money. You love David Cameron, he made you money. Mm -hmm. He broke the economy and he broke the country, he made you money. And I won't be the clown that stands there performing for you because yeah. it's just like being 13 again. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah shame, shame on all those alumni who want to have their cake and eat it, who go, that's not in our name, but say nothing in public because mm -hmm. they're cowards. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, so now you're 22. Yeah. Having a, having a tipple yeah. in London. Yes. No, in Oxford, it was tequila. <laughs> <laughs> I ran a tequila night in Oxford despite not drinking tequila. And, and then I, you thought, I might have one. Yeah, and the first five drinks I had were shots of tequila. Strong. The same evening. Yeah. And I went home totally fine. How did totally that fine, go? Totally fine. Say. And I'm like, it was like a whole new world. I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. It was like getting the Infinity Stones. <laughs> yeah. But it was a big moment of your life. You sort of, be, you know, you become a grown-up, I guess. Yeah. And you... Well, I don't know. I don't want to put words into your mouth, but you you, fine, you, you start you, you 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 start to think actually, I'm going to just breathe out a bit. Yes. And let some of it go. The weird thing was by then I was afraid of myself because I hadn't drunk for so long. I was like, what if I'm a monster? 
what if I drink and I'm a monster, right? Because I was afraid, because you don't know, right? What effect alcohol have on me? And I was actually having a drink around the corner, um, one of several in the next few years, and I was out and I was like, oh my God, like, okay, it's my second pint, I've become a monster now. And she's like, no, you're just even more merry. You're just a really <laughs> merry person. And I was like, and she was almost like, it's fine. Mm. You're just merry when you're drunk. And I was mm. like, thank goodness. Yeah, so. And you started, yeah. now you come across, like the, the energy that comes from you is somebody who uh, is comfortable with your decisions. You kind of packaged up your life. You can see what's your choices, the things that have happened to you. And obviously you have a voice because you're creative and, and articulate and all of those things. Mm. There's you're 22, did you say 43 now? There's 20 yeah. years in between. Yes. Just to take us through the steps, because you're obviously not the finished article when you're 22. Oh my God, who is, right? Yeah. Unless you're killing Mbappe, right? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> not jealous, not jealous. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, 22, so 22 was a weird year because I also came out as bisexual. Yeah. Although I thought I was, that's a long story. I thought I was, I didn't think the bisexuality existed. I thought you we were one or the other, right? Yeah. So I had a girlfriend at the time. Well, in the, so mid noughties now, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, came out as bisexual at university because I, I, well, I was gay. I was like, well, I think I'm gay. And she was like, but it's still attracting. I was like, yeah, but you're not bisexual. I was like, well, does that exist? Is it a thing? Because back then it wasn't a thing. Listen, mm. people, especially in the conservative like homes like mine, it, didn't ex it wasn't a thing. It mm. wasn't real. Mm. To some people, it's still not real. Mm. So I came out that year, and then that was such a psychological, like it broke me basically. Like I was revising for exams, and my, my brain was not retaining information. I failed, I think, I, I'd never failed an exam, I'd, I'd never failed an exam until that point. And I, I failed five exams that summer at law school. So my brain would not hold information because it couldn't, it was like, your life is a wreck. You're, 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 a, con, you're, you're a black guy from a conservative Ugandan background, of course, the Uganda law has just passed, the LGBT law. Your life is gone, like, everything you've achieved at this point is, is forfeit. And to be honest, that was not an unrealistic fear because as we've seen recently, we're being murdered for that, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's probably not safe for me to return to Uganda at this point with mm -hmm. my platform and my visibility. Yeah. It's probably not safe. Or if not, it's un it will be highly uncomfortable. So that was 22, um, came out, shell shock, start playing for queer football team because although being bisexual was still difficult um, and my family was difficult with it and still is in some respects, I was good at football. So I played for Stonewall for two years and that was an amazing experience. And I still have friends to this day from that, that time. I left my job as a lawyer. So I took a 90% pay cut as it worked out. I went to become a performance poet. I lived in Croydon. Uh, I know, I was earning 800. Was your mum thrilled? <laughs> she was probably more offended by the poetry than the sexuality. Yeah, yeah. Which is saying something. <laughs> You're bisexual, oh, you're a poet. Oh. <laughs> um, so at the age of 25, became a performance poet and went in the, and just went for it. Played all the circus, Edinburgh Fringe, did like five star shows. Everything started picking up. Football writing came out of nowhere. I just tried my hand at different stuff. I started working music, started doing stuff, writing theme music for stuff. It just, I kept trying new things and the new things were working enough for me to keep going at them, but nothing really took off until like three years ago. Then all of a sudden, like the pandemic, right? It was almost like I was quietly doing my thing for ages and all of a sudden the pandemic came, I was just working along. It was almost like when everyone's talking and then like all of the music cuts out and there's just someone in the corner just like playing quietly on the piano and it's like, oh, who's that guy playing quiet, consistent music? Mm. And everything just took, everything exploded. Three years ago, my whole life transformed, yeah. And you now live in Germany, you've been there a long time. Yeah, nine years, nine years. <sighs> Okay. So why did you move again from complete, to, to, complete, to Germany? Like why did you chance. leave? Yeah. So I went from like Oxford, moved to London, all over London, and moved at the age of 34 to Berlin. And so I was covering the World Cup in 2018, uh, 2014 in Brazil um, for a few different outlets. By that point, my football writing career was going to a certain place. And I'm having like, dinner with a guy who I got talking to on the plane over. Like he was returning to Rio where he runs a firm of architects with his wife, amazing guy, right? Who ended up running for the mayor of Rio and got a few thousand votes, amazing oh. guy on a progressive platform. And he's like, Musa, why are you still in, why are you still in the UK? It's not a forward thinking country. It's not international. I was like, yeah, it is. He's like, no, London's international. The UK is not. Mm. Why don't you go abroad? And I was like, funny, because I was considering moving to Amsterdam or Stockholm. And he said, why not Berlin? 
And I was like, oh, never thought of it. And I thought, hang on a minute, I did German A-level. Like, I did German to university standard. I completely forgot 20 years ago. Like, German, it's like, but it's, within six weeks, I had a flat in Berlin. Really? Yeah. I completely forgot. I hadn't used German for 20 years. And there it was. It was like a bit rusty. But now I'm teaching in it. So yeah. the theme of today is about exploring this idea of home and belonging and stuff like that. I want yeah. to talk to you about football in a second. But at the age of 34, mm. moving to a completely new country, yeah. and you turn up in Berlin, mm. big yeah. football playing black dude who says he's a performance poet. Yeah. Did, I really want to know how that experience felt. Oh, they loved the, love that. It was they go for that they shit? They love that chaos. <laughs> oh, 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 yeah. oh, we're friends. That's, it's it's Berlin. trendy Berlin, right? It's a sort it's, of... It's chaotic. It's yeah. what it is. Yeah, yeah. It's... Um, that was, it's funny, it's funny you put it that way because I, I went there to kind of disappear, ironically enough, which is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's not worked out so well, but <laughs> I, would, I went there to be off the radar. I went there just to kind of go away and make work. And my mum said, Musa, why are you going there? You've got no networks there, no friends. And I said, that's why I'm doing it. And she burst you out laughing. You knew nobody there? I knew like three people and two of them had left within four months. Gosh. So I basically knew no one. And I just was like, okay, whole new world go for it and just made it work. And so what do you need to have around you to feel at home in a place? Never look back. Say again? Never look back. Never when you're arriving back. in a new place to make a life, don't think about, don't dwell on regret. Don't dwell on, I should have been there. Don't dwell on a bad day. Don't dwell on a, like, my, 35th, my 34th birthday, I had an awful day with a really disrespectful person mm. and it was miserable. And I was like, I've got to have a good experience before this date ends because it was midnight on my 34th birthday. She didn't know it was my birthday because I wanted to. And it was like, never look back, never, never regret. So what you need is you need a positive attitude all the time if you're away from home because you can't have that whole sliding doors thing if I stayed behind. You also need friends who, friends who don't care what you do. And that's the beauty of Berlin. No one cares what you do for a living. No one cares less. Really? You could be a Formula, yeah, it could be a Formula One driver, no one cares. If you're boring, they'll get up and leave. So that's not a topic of conversation, not what people say. Oh, my God, you could know someone for two months and not know what they did for a living. Really? They don't care. Here, it's the first two seconds of what yeah. you do. This like, yeah, it's the question. It's the barcode. Everyone's scanning like this, scanning. London's a barcode. What city. do they ask you instead? They're like, oh, like, what are you up to the weekend? Oh. What are you up to? Like, what are you about? What's your thing? What's your vibe? What's your energy? That's like, that's the Berlin thing, you know. Interesting. Yeah, and that was the perfect city because no one cared. Um... I didn't talk about my football writing, whatever. A lot of people didn't know what I did, actually, um, which was perfect, really. Didn't do a poetry gig for the first six months. I just eased myself into it, yeah. And so you think you'll stay there forever or no? No, I don't think I will, no. um, because the far right is rising really fast. The vote has doubled more than... It's more than doubled in just less than a year. If the far right enter government in 2025, I won't be there. But that will also be because my time there is done, like... yeah. Berlin is not a young city, but it's predominantly a young city. Um, and I'd be 40, 45, 46 in 2025. And that arc of my life might be over. Mm. It's an amazing city to live your early 20s to mid 40s in. It may not be the best city to live my mid 40s to whatever in. So even if I leave within the next year, two years, we've had an incredible run. Are your siblings year. spread around all over or have they stayed broadly in London? Or? One, of them is, one of them is in Thailand at the moment. Like, everyone's scattered, everyone's all over the place. Really? You know? Yeah. That's it. Why, why do you think that is? I'm going to be dramatic. Maybe refugees. Like, you, that, you look at where my cousins are scattered, we're all over the world. Right. So we're used to having to adapt and move if something's not perfect. We don't get nostalgic about spaces. Well, not as, we get nostalgic, we don't get attached to places. There's a part of me that's always ready to pack my bags and go. And I think that's the same, that's true of my siblings as well. There's a resilience yeah. there. Yeah. Um, if you want to ask a question, please stick your hand up. Um, I can keep going for ages, but we're, we've got to finish in 10 minutes, so don't be shy. Um, I'm really interested in, um, I'm a, I get terrible homesickness. I'm, mm. sh I'm shit at going on holiday even. Mm. I know I was grumpy about my flight being cancelled, but I was secretly relieved. Um, <laughs> the, and, and as somebody who grew up in a very, you know, two and a half bedroom, Pebble Dash semi in Yorkshire, my mum and dad stayed together. It was super straightforward. Mm. And I think of that place, literally that house. And when I go back to Yorkshire, I drive past the house like a widow wow. and, and have a feeling. I don't know what the feeling is. It is really hard for me to imagine being able to feel 
sort of, I don't know, centered or all of my, all the bits of me are attached together with that feeling like you say of I could pack my bag at any minute and not and not look back. So do you do you feel are you are you at peace, I suppose is what I'm saying. Oh yeah. Profoundly. Um it's funny because I go through old places, I go past the house I grew up doesn't I have no connection to it at all. I go past, sad to say, I go through Windsor and I see Eton and I feel sadness and disappointment. Um, at a school that was meant to create some of the greatest leaders, but really a lot of people just served themselves. That's really kind of heartbreaking because mm. I just thought I expected better, you know? Yeah. Um, and then I go to Oxford and that's home. It's so strange. I went back there for the first time in years, right? Um, How interesting. Years. Yeah, it was weird. You can never, you don't know where home is till you go there. And I go, you get the train up from London and you go over the railway bridge. Yes. And the moment I came out of the station, I was like, oh my God, I'm home. Every time. Uncanny, yeah. So how long did you live in Oxford after you graduated? Only a year. I was there for four oh, years. But gosh. in that time, it was so pivotal. I met these incredible humans. Like one guy that passed away recently, rest his soul, Eusebius MacKaiser. He died at the age of 45, and the time of his death was regarded as the greatest intellectual in the public sphere that South Africa had of his generation. But, so you met all these incredible in four years, but also you had this incredible pastoral care from your tutors. So if anywhere's home, it's probably there, actually. How interesting. Yeah. There's some marks, but I can't see anything. So if you've got a question, you're broadly over there. Yeah, sure. That's at the back row. Hiya. Hi, thank you. Um, you're wonderful. Thank you so much for your time. You're interested in um, that moment when you allow the pressure to kind of come off your shoulders a bit, go into poetry and all, and all of that. Was it ever difficult watching your Eton peers who you knew you were just as smart as kind of ascending and running the world around you? Or were you just so happy to be relieved you know, of the, that pressure? The weirdest thing happened. You won't believe this because it sounds like a corny. You will, sorry, you will believe it because you just, but it's corny, right? So I was having um, just a few, so I thought I was a loser for years doing this weird like creative path like this and everyone else has gone off and made millions and whatever <laughs> and become heads of companies. I had, drink two weeks ago with a guy who said, Musa, until I got my most recent promotion, he's gone up and made millions, right? He said, until I got my most recent promotion, this drink today would have been intimidating. It was, it, I hadn't seen him for 15 years. And he was like, it was intimidating to come have a drink with you until now. Because he said, I was sitting with some friends by the other day. One is a, a current MP. One is um, head of like a hedge fund. And he's head of a department of a multinational. He said, we were having a conversation a couple of years ago about who the most successful person had been of our generation, and the unanimous answer was you. The wow. unanimous answer was you. And I was like, oh my God. For 22 years, I thought I was a loser because doing what I do for a living is tough and you're having to like push. But they'd just been watching it from the outside going, this dude is writing essays, he's out there, and like the work is, because I don't see the reach of my work, even with social media and Twitter and Instagram, because I don't get too caught up in the reach of the work, I'm just trying to make it and move on, right? So I couldn't tell you a single, a single metric of an article I've written in terms of its reach. But they've been out there watching for 22 years going, that guy's done it. So when I was at Oxford, right, so they, they gave me a fellowship, right, at Oxford, which is the highest honor they can give you. And they were like, it's an outstanding contribution in public life. And I was like, I got the news, and I went and I saw the president of the college, and she said to me, I was like, oh, yeah, um, Professor Black, my name's Musa. She was like, Musa, I know who you are. She was like, own it. And mm -hmm. I think I've never owned it. I think even from the mid 2000s, for 20 odd years, I've been there going, oh God, I'm just a total loser. And I never owned it. And the whole time, all these people around were going, no, that's the measure of a life. So yeah, I had all that pressure that actually the pressure didn't go until, the pressure didn't disappear till, to your answer your question, the pressure didn't disappear until two years ago. Two years ago. And I'm, that was 41 that I finally allowed myself to be like, I've made something of my life. You yeah. really have. Thank you for your question. Where's Thank the mic? Cat. Hi. Hello. Sorry, um, Cat. I, I work at Tortoise. Sorry, it's me again. Um, I'm, I, <laughs> sorry, everyone. Um, <laughs> it's me. Uh, I was really kind of struck by um, a lot of what you said in relation to Eton, yeah. I suppose. Yeah. And uh, my impression of what you were saying was that actually. Um, your sort of biggest kind of most foundational kind of impression is that school. Mm. Um, and it may just be that we're talking about it right now. Um, but but um, 
I, I'm kind of intrigued as to the extent to which I think um, the sort of dislocation mm. uh, between you and your family was caused by by that experience and being a sort of boarding school child and whether that's kind of why you you see Oxford as your home rather than either Eton or your family upbringing. Oxford felt fair. Oxford felt fair in a way that Eton didn't. People went to Eton who... There's a guy who earns... The guy that was bottom of our year... One of the guys upon earns millions of pounds because of his connections. He wasn't a smart dude, right? He wasn't a smart dude. And that, he doesn't work ridiculously hard. But you don't, no, sorry just my, to interrupt, you don't yeah. think it's about being sort of removed from your family at a younger age and-, and I think that uh, it's about the pastoral care I received. Like my mum my brought up five of us, so I didn't ask for anything. I didn't ask for anything. Like, I never took home a problem because I was just like, and my friends don't believe it. So, no, I, I literally never took home a problem I hadn't solved already. I got the crap kicked out of me at my prep school before I went to Eton by racists, and I had to solve it. I got racist bullying when I started at Eton. I had to solve it. I had to fight. And I never took that home. My mom, I told my mum like, years later. So the dislocation, you're right, there was an element of that. And Oxford was the first place where I felt... And I, my housemaster who died at Eton was an amazing guy, but Oxford was the first place that I felt truly welcomed, like I could unburden myself. It was and the first so is place that, that's where you feel home yeah, is? Yeah, and that's, mm. so it's a great question, but I had to explain the context of what, yeah, mm. because it was the first place I could actually ask for something. I couldn't ask for help at home because everyone else was, mum was too busy raising four other kids. Interesting. I can see Paul in the middle because I can see the shape of his hat. And I'm thinking it is Paul. I can't see anything else but the hat. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, Paul Atherton, I'm a Tortoise member. Um, I always remember as a child growing up watching a Parkinson interview with Muhammad Ali. And Muhammad Ali was said, if you weren't the greatest boxer in the world, what would you have been? And I remember his answer as if it was yesterday. And he turned around and he goes, oh, if I was a dustman, I'd be the greatest dustman that had ever lived uh -huh. on the planet. Um, and I just wondered, do, do, do you think if you hadn't had the advantages of Eton and Oxford and all the other sort of privilege, as we put in inverted commas, that you would have found yourself still in the same place as you do today? I think I might have achieved more, to be honest. I think I wasted a lot of time trying to recalibrate. I think I would have achieved more for my community and for people in general. Um, I think some of it was time wasted in some ways. Uh, I'm very proud of the journey I had. Um, but I don't, look, here's the thing. You go to a school like that, the age, I was top, I was top, I was top of my year in Berkshire, right? It was me and another guy, me and Bijan. Bijan was ahead of me in class. We were the top two students in the whole of Berkshire, right? We would have achieved whatever we'd done. We got to Eton. We were an easy, he went to, so he went to um, Wellington. We were an easy sell, right? We were like hardworking kids, never been in trouble. We were an easy sell. So in a way, they benefited because they got to say, look, here's this amazing. They didn't perfect us. We were smart as hell. We might have been more valuable in our communities in the Thames Valley, just going to Langley Grammar and doing more. So I might have done more with my life, to be honest, if I'm honest with myself. Instead of wasting time navel-gazing with this accent and this whatever, I might have done more out in the world. Um, so yeah, like privilege is not always a good thing, I think. Um, I'm proud of my time at Oxford, but Eton, I could have taken or leave in it, actually. I could have taken or left it, if I'm honest. Um, we're going to have to stop. I'm sorry, it's sad, isn't it? Um, Mr, thank you so much for extending your trip to hang around thank and talk you. to us. I think you should be so proud of what you've achieved. I really do. What a lovely man, can I just say. <laughs> <laughs> what a fucking lovely man. It's a real pleasure to talk to you. Thanks for watching that video. If you enjoyed that, we think you'll love these and if you want to join us for the next live recording of Tortoise Lates, head to tortoisemedia.com forward slash book.